Well, hello everyone. This is going to be the first in a series of lectures on the Renaissance in Europe. Um, we'll be looking at the um, Italian Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance. We'll be looking at some of the economic preconditions of Renaissance. We'll be looking at some of the artistic production that comes out of it, as well as some of the political ramifications of this period, which scholars really since the middle of the 19th century have regarded as the first of the modern periods. Um, for many years there was a bit of a debate as to where the Renaissance um, was most appropriately taught in any curricula, where, whether that was um, in a high school class, a European history class, a uh, college level course, whether it was the last of the medieval ages, the Middle Ages, or the first of the modern. It was really with the great Swiss historian Jakob Burckhardt that we consider the Renaissance to be the first of, of the modern period. And we can see in many ways in which some of the themes of modernity really ha uh, trace their origins to this, to this period. Some of the core themes we'll address when looking at the Renaissance is first and foremost the questioning of tradition. Um, by the end of the Middle Ages and, and, and quite a lot of the thinkers of the Middle Ages tended to refer back to um, individuals, individual writings from antiquity and from the early Middle Ages as what they considered to be authoritative. And that really comes into question in, in the early Renaissance. What lends something authority just because it's ancient? Um, just because a, um, a medieval theologian said this is the way in which something ought to be interpreted. Um, is that really the way it ought to be interpreted? Um, and to that end, that questioning of authority will uh, have so many ramifications. It will have ramifications on the church. It will have ramifications on government institutions. It will have ramifications in the areas of science and medicine. Um, in large part because individuals, uh, individual thinkers in the 15th and 16th century are going to go back to the original sources uh, and they're going to evaluate them firsthand. So to some extent then, th this means that there's going to be a reorientation of the policies of government, of state. Um, they will become increasingly less dynastic and increasingly more statist, which means that it's less of a, a series of, of personal relationships, which we talked about during the Middle Ages, the so-called Lord Vassal relationship, which was the foundation of feudalism, and 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 engage in really more of a, a contract between uh, the individual members of society together as a whole. Uh, under whatever form of government they may have, whether that is a constitutional state uh, in which law reigns supreme, or it's more, more likely, um, at least in the early modern period that we're studying right now, um, a single individual, a, a king, a monarch. Another major theme of the Renaissance is humanism. Um, it is a, a reorientation towards the, the studying of humanity and all of its diversity. But unlike what many might say today about humanism, uh, humanism is seen as being anti-Christian. At the time of the Renaissance, it was not. It was something that was seen as being kind of a handmaiden of faith, of belief, but it was certainly a reorientation of Christian belief patterns. There was also a civic orientation towards the humanist uh, agenda, um, it was designed not simply to be a, an abstract philosophy, um, but it was it was really it was supposed to have a, a specific um, uh, a specific application to everyday events. Um, uh, histories were written for reasons uh, that that uh, leaders could rally people to support a particular policy. Um, and so, so much of the, the essays that were written uh, had, a, had an agenda, uh, an agenda that we need to, to fully understand. Uh, these are, are not unbiased writers during this time. Uh, they have a point that they want to make, and they're using all the powers of learning to achieve that. 
As I mentioned a moment ago, there's a return to sources. So, for instance, uh, instead of reading Plato and Aristotle and and uh, all the, the the Greek philosophical tradition through a commentator um, like Boethius, uh, the comment, uh, the consolation of philosophy that was very very popular at the end of the Roman period, uh, in which ex excerpts of in ancient philosophies were were pulled out, and specific comments were made on them for um, to edify a largely Christian audience, and the parts that weren't necessarily edifying to a Christian audience or, or might be seen as anti-Christian, were discarded or set aside or ignored. Now, what scholars are going to do is they're going to return to those sources in their entirety and they're going to evaluate them for what they are, not for how useful they might be. And Once they understand what they are, then um, they can use them for, for to advance their own particular philosophical or um, civic needs. Finally, um, one must say, I, I, I kind of agree with uh, a statement made by uh, Lord Kenneth Clark, one of the great uh, historians of art in the 20th century, that, uh, that the Renaissance did not produce any great innovative philosophy. Uh, certainly nothing very abstract, certainly nothing very f speculative, um, because the the types of, of uh, sort of human ingenuity that was engaged with during this time were more artistic and not necessarily philosophical in the very sort of formal sense of what we, what we would call philosophy. Um, there are certainly ethical considerations. Philosophy is being, um, uh, is being used. Uh, ancient philosophy is, is, is coming back with a vengeance in certain forms anyway, the Platonic form. Um, and, and folks are thinking about that, but there isn't really a new philosophy that comes uh, comes about during this time. That will have to wait for for a later later time period. Okay? So these are some of the major themes of the Renaissance. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's first look at the Renaissance in Italy. This is this is the place. This is the time really that the historian Burkhart really looked at and said, you know in his the title of his famous book, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, uh, this is the time really when he argues that modernity begins. And as we are very modern historians now, contemporary historians, we are going to look first at the economic conditions that sort of lay the groundwork for this time. Um, one of the most important things, and that we've seen already from the end of the Middle Ages, um, continuing on now, is a revival of trade. Um, trade links uh, that had been uh, sort of um, examined and, and looked at with the with the Crusader period, um, Genoa and Venice competing for the Byzantine trade network. That, uh, as the Byzantine Empire was falling apart uh, from the 13th century onwards, um, a lot of Western Europeans are getting very very interested in this, the commercial goods that are coming out of the Near East especially those Eastern Mediterranean goods, which we have already called the rich trades. Um, these would be the trades, again, in silk and spices and aromatics, uh, gems, some precious metals, but um, um, exotic woods, ivories, uh, even, even some uh, things, like, you know, things like oranges. Uh, these are going to be really very, very popular. And uh, that's going to enrich particularly the Italian city-states that are engaged in uh, overseas uh, commercial trade. A different kind of economic revival is going on in the northern part of Europe, but it is enriching those cities significantly. That's the bulk trade. Um, the bulk trade would largely be um, grain shipments that are coming in from Eastern Europe, down the river systems to ports along the uh, Baltic Sea, and then they are being transported through the um, through the Vic, through that that um, narrow passage between Denmark and Sweden and Norway, um, and from there over to England, to Holland, to France, and so forth. Um, so redistributing. Uh, foodstuffs from where there is plenty to where there is um, 
uh, where there is not uh, nearly that kind of abundance, and particularly those regions of Western Europe that where the population is growing very rapidly in the later 14 and 1500s as those regions begin to recover in population from the effects of the plague. Uh, <clears throat> this revival of trade, uh, the towns in northern Italy, um, uh, the Low Countries in Netherlands and Belgium, uh, as well as along the city-states that uh, dot the North Sea and Baltic Sea coast, the Hanseatic League, uh, is really the necessary precondition of, of increasing wealth that will lead to, um, shall we say, a, a, a new interest in the arts, a new interest in learning that wouldn't happen in times where there wasn't nearly that kind of abundance. Uh, where where survival was was more critical as let's say the 1360s the 1370s when we're looking at the sort of the the high tide of the plague years this revival of trade is also facilitated around the same time by um, the improvement in banking the banking system um, the fugas of Augsburg um, really helped facilitate trade uh, between those territories north of the Alps Mountains and those territories south of it. The Bardi and the Medici in Italy are very, very successful in helping the Genoese and Venetians finance their overseas uh, expeditions. And in large part, this is, this is due to um, creating a <coughs> system of branch banking um, where credit can be acquired in one branch, let's say, that might be set up in Alexandria in Egypt, uh, cash can be advanced there um, because there's there's enough money for that particular creditor in a bank back in Florence or Naples or wherever they happen to come from. And we can see from this map, we see sort of the uh, the nature of the trade. We see sort of the, the Mediterranean trade routes down in here. Okay, all coming from different ports along the Levant coast here and Egypt down in here and how that's largely going through Italy. And then we see another sort of nexus of trade that's occurring up here. This is the Baltic Sea Coast. These are those Hanseatic League states that we see here. Okay, There is certainly long-distance trade that goes around the Iberian Peninsula. All right, uh, And then there are trade routes across Europe. That's very, very important. Uh, Augsburg uh, in Germany actually sits very on, you know, astride these trade routes up in here. So that's why the Fugers are so important in terms of their banking. Another major area is um, up through here, through uh, into France, uh, the Lyon Fairs, uh, very, very important trade hub. Uh, rich goods coming up north from Italy, coming to this area, and then can be dispersed through many parts of northern and western Europe. Okay, so let's look at first at these Italian city-states um, and what's going on there. The Italian Italian politics is is really all over the place. We'll see a map of Italy and, and we'll see that it, it as one um, commentator noted, Italy is more of a geographic expression um, than anything else. Um, Italy during this time is very divided, lots of city-states, small independent kingdoms, the papal states. Uh, we'll look at a list of them in a moment. Uh, but the main factions between these different city-states, what divided them was their allegiance either to the Pope or to the Holy Roman Emperor throughout the late Middle Ages. The Guelph group uh, faction tended to ally itself more with the, um, with the papacy, with the Pope in Rome, the Bishop of Rome, while the Ghibellines tended to support the Holy Roman Emperor. And this always had so much to do with who came to power in what city-state and when, and whether they supported that Guelph faction or whether they um, supported the Ghibellines and so forth. So that's really sort of the, the, the background politics. It doesn't really come too much into play. It gets really complex. So we'll set that aside. It's just an important feat, facet of, of, of uh, medieval Italian politics. As we said a moment ago, there was renewed economic uh, capacity in these uh, in these city states, um, Genoa and Venice particularly built significant trade empires. Florence 
uh, another really important city-state for the development of the of the art of the Renaissance uh, is based on on banking, and particularly its famous banking family, the Medici. And in large part, this translated into Italian naval dominance of the Eastern Mediterranean. Most of the naval battles that will be fought uh, in the time period all the way down to the early 1700s, really, are really fought by Italian navies that are hired by the other land uh, territorial states, like the French or the Spanish, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, and they will hire out, contract out, men like Andrea Doria, uh, the Genoese uh, uh, admiral, uh, and his fleet to fight their wars for them. Um, the only major rival to the Italian city-states will emerge in the form of the Turkish Empire uh, after about 1470 or so. The Turks will begin, uh, once they have conquered Constantinople in 1453, uh, they will set about um, consolidating their, their um, land empire and then building an important navy. Within each city-state, there are several social classes and they are often in, ten in tension with one another. Uh, at the top of the social ladder were the traditional aristocratic elites, people who had titles, uh, people who were dukes or, um, uh, or marquises, things like that. They were the grandi, right? They had their titles going all the way back to um, the whole, usually the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, they had titles that had been bestowed upon them by the emperors and so on. Then there was the rich merchant class, the populo grosso, populo, people, grosso, big or fat people, um, it had nothing to do with their um, physical form, more their pocketbooks. Uh, they were very, very wealthy merchants. Um, and it was a fairly new class that had emerged, so we would call them nouveau riche, the newly rich. And they will be the ones who are, large, who are largely responsible for becoming patrons of the arts. Oftentimes, they will try to get their children married into the traditional elite class, the grandi, so that, um, you know, a, the wealthy heiress of a merchant is married to the son of an old ducal family, and they sort of put together the, the best of the best in, in the elites of Italian society. Then you had a middle class, um, fairly small middle class of merchants and shopkeepers, um, you know, the sort of normal everyday trade type things. And then finally you had the little people, the poorer classes in each city-state, the popolo minuto. And we'll look at the city-states here. And you can see down here there's a large kingdom of uh, where Sicily and southern Italy. This is, um, this is headquartered around Naples. So this is sometimes called the kingdom of Napoli, Naples or the kingdom of the two Sicilies. In central Italy, you have the Papal States. Um, at this point in time, I think this is uh, part of Romagna and Urbino. They're not part of it, but that would eventually fall under the Papal States um, by the early 1500s. Uh, Florence over here with Siena. Eventually, Siena will become a part of Florence. <coughs> you have smaller territories up here in the southern part of the Po River Valley. And then you have uh, the two sort of giants of the north, Venice, very powerful, influential um, naval power here. And then you have Milan, the great land-based power here that serves as, uh, as, in a way, the kind of buffer between the Holy Roman Empire and France and the rest of Italy. And then over here you have another major naval power in the form of Genoa. Okay. It should be noted, though, that Naples, for a long time, is either uh, under the control of a branch of the Spanish royal family or the French royal family. It does change hands over the course of late medieval and Renaissance history. So you can see how a little bit of intervention from some of the other countries uh, north and west of Italy can really make this sort of a, a really chaotic uh, problem. And Italian unity will not be achieved until well into the modern period. It's not until 1870 that this entire region here um, actually becomes the modern day um, uh, the modern day country of Italy. Um, and it's not until 1919 
after World War One that this northern part of Italy up in here actually, um, right in here actually, joins um, joins the rest of the country. So, very quickly, the Italian city states each have a different form of government. Um, Milan is ruled by the Viconti and Sforza families. Uh, Florence is for some time a republic. Other times the republic is taken over and influenced very heavily by the Medici family. Venice is not a republic. It's not a monarchy. It is an oligarchy. It's ruled by about ten oligarchs called the Doge, uh, of which one they'll take turns in terms of who will be the, sort of the supreme leader of Venice. Rome is very definitely a monarchy, and it's, but that monarchy is from the Pope. Okay, so the Pope is the uh, not just the spiritual ruler of Roman Catholics in all of Europe, but he is also the temporal ruler of that large swath of territory in central Italy. And Naples in the south is a monarchy. French control in the late Middle Ages, Spanish control after 1435. Throw into the mix sort of rival gangs of freelance military generals, uh, a lot of these leaders that we've seen in these city-states here are not actually aren't really uh, sort of raising their own armies. Instead, what they're doing is they're hiring sort of prefabbed armies under really great generals, which are called condottieri. Um, and so they're very personal. They're very mercenary. In a sense, it's not unlike the kinds of armies that fought for ancient Rome. Uh, Roman armies, as much as they were the Senate, they represented the Senate and the people of Rome. They were very much, their first allegiance was to um, their general, whether that was Julius Caesar or it was Pompey uh, or Mark Antony or whoever it was. Way back in ancient times, it was very, very personal generalship. That tradition in Italian politics has carried through to the modern era. Because the condottieri could throw a real wrench into the works, uh, very aspiring condottieri could, could influence a particular city-state to go to war, War was rather endemic in the late Middle Ages and the early modern period in Italy. Um, however, by 15, uh, 1454, uh, a treaty was signed which basically called a, a general peace throughout Italy, um, established a balance of power between the various city-states, um, a couple of big alliance blocks formed, and that kept the peace for about 40 years or so. And that's the 40 years in which really the, the, the Renaissance that we know of really flourishes uh, in that peaceful yet still slightly competitive time period, com com competition between those city-states. Um, this was only broken with the French military invasion in 1494, which was invited by actually the Milanese to settle a dispute that they had with Naples. Which leads us to the next slide. Um, one Milanese ruler who was having a bit of a tiff with Ma Naples decides he's going to call in the French. And that really upset the balance of power in Italy. Uh, everyone was set on a war footing. Eventually the Spanish are called in. The Spanish have connections with the Holy Roman Empire. They are called in. Uh, and Italy becomes a battleground uh, for these other major European territories. Uh, the Medici, who were so influential in Renaissance Italy, were overthrown. Uh, and in, in the absence of the Medici, Florence got a, the sort of fanatical rule of Savonarola, uh, who was a, who was a, a monk, um, and he, he thought that the decline of Florence was, was because of all the, the art and the jewelry and the finery and that they'd gotten away from God. So he, he orders that everybody basically offer up their artwork and their jewels and their fine things and throw them on a big bonfire, the so-called bonfire of the vanities. Um, Ferdinand of Aragon, the king of Aragon, uh, wife of his, or husband of Isabella, um, uh, the, the two folks who commissioned Columbus to sail to the New World. Ferdinand of Aragon responds with an alliance of his own to oppose the French. And what we'll see throughout it all is that the papacy tends to switch sides because of its very precarious position between uh, the stronger kingdom of Naples in the south and the smaller city-states in northern Italy. And so the popes will be switching sides in order to maintain their own uh, fragile position. Eventually, the, these wars will coalesce into a series of wars that will be fought over the course of the modern period 
between the Habsburg family who rules Spain and the Holy Roman Empire and the Valois family, uh, which rules France. That'll be the kind of classic fault line in Europe um, well into the 1700s. It will be sort of the, the Germany versus France uh, uh, wars. Much of it will be fought in Italy by proxy. So as opposed to the French and the, the Holy Roman Empire going to war directly against each other, they'll sort of have their, uh, their satellites, the, those territories in Italy that, 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 they, that are, are very influential, sort of duke it out among themselves and thus keep Italy uh, from uniting. Uh, in this early period, the Borgia family is very, very influential. They produced Pope Alexander VI. He was very ambitious to extend papal power in Italy. Um, he uh, plays with Venice for a while uh, before eventually throwing him his support again behind the French. His successor, however, uh, Julius II, uh, really wants to achieve his own political goals for um, stabilizing the, 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 the papal states and so he joins with the Holy Roman Empire against France. Uh, in all, what happens is, uh, we don't know, have to uh, know all the nitty-gritty details here for our purposes, uh, but what happens eventually is a, the Concordat of Bologna in 1516. And that's important because it gives the French king a great deal of control over the Catholic clergy in France. After 1516, the French king actually, be, in, in a sense, becomes um, the head of the Church of France. And in exchange for that, the French sort of back out of Italy and leave everybody alone. Uh, but that was what, what had to be exchanged there. The Pope only has very nominal control uh, over who, his, uh, who the, uh, the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church in France would actually be. And that will have some pretty dramatic, um, pretty dramatic impact on uh, politics in France uh, all the way down until the period of the French Revolution. And for the time being right there, uh, we're going to uh, pause and we'll come back for another lecture at another time. Thank you for listening.